I worked at a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns. Most were fine. Some caused issues, like when we caught two of them making out in the file room. Overall, though, they were just normal kids from high school or college, trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern a bit later than usual, right around in the middle of summer. Warner was a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age, maybe late 20s. We initially hit it off pretty well, and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind since he was very friendly and we had some common interests as well. He was the only person in my department who was even remotely close to my age. The interns were all teenagers, and the regular staff averaged around 60, older than my mom even. I was psyched to have a peer to chat with, so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner or stop to talk at his cubicle. His strangeness was mostly an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness. I got zero bad vibes from the guy. It wasn't long before Warner started having major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally started acting pretty unprofessionally. One day, he showed up to work at 3.15 p.m. when the workday ended at 4.30. Our office manager was livid and told him to just go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office, but I did not supervise him, and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past as well. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't too big a deal to me. If you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle had donated to the campaign of our big boss. He wasn't going anywhere. Near the end of that summer, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and relocating to a new state. Once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give a sympathetic yeah, I know. He would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disruptive to the people who sat near me. I found it slightly annoying, but I was also extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner. I spent my last month there not caring much about what my co-workers thought, so I tolerated him lingering by my desk. One day, he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus, and occasionally other co-workers would offer me rides home if they were going the same way, so this didn't seem very odd to me. I accepted and walked to his car with him. It smelled awful and was full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized. We got on our way, but once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said he didn't need to ask me that insistently, and said we could do so on the way. We had a nice meal with a pleasant conversation. He was intelligent and had a variety of interests. Our political positions aligned, and we shared disdain for our cranky old co-workers. I actually had a pretty good time. I expressed that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was so late, but he kept insisting, so I relented. As I directed him towards my house, he started in again with the whining about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was pretty tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make, and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing, and eventually his whining faded out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street, and when I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it while laughing. I laughed in an oh gee what the fuck kind of way, thinking he was just joking around. When I began giving him instructions about how to turn around and get back though, he started begging me to keep hanging out with him because he was so lonely. This immediately set me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that I'm in a man's car, someone I don't know that well, who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context I know him, 
and now he's displaying weird behavior outside as well. My instinct was not to insist that I be let out of the car. I felt as if this would escalate the situation into something bad, and in hindsight, it may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person he turned out to be. I told him we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk. He seemed to like that idea, and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed. Besides the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to, actually, until he dumped his entire life story on me. Including his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction, and related struggles with depression, I tried to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this, understandably. It was a lot of highly personal information, all bombarded at once, and I was still on high alert because of his prior behavior. I tried changing the subject by showing him pics of my dog. I scrolled one pic too far, though, and the next one was a photo of me wearing makeup and posing cutely, way different than the slob I presented myself at work. He grabbed the phone from my hands. Wow. You're very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything. There was a long silence. Then he launched into a weird tangent about how compatible we are. We have similar interests. That he wishes I wasn't moving. So we could try hanging out again, but on a date. I didn't say anything. He broke the silence with, Sorry I'm saying all this stuff. I'm actually really high right now. That's why I know where Riverside, bad neighborhood that had previously come up in conversation, is. I went there yesterday, to buy. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have said it. I'm really sorry. Internally, I freaked out. He had definitely put his drug addiction in the past tense, and I assumed it was something he was recovering from, not currently using. I also realized I had been in a car he was operating, while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin, so I was clueless, and I felt very, very stupid. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him, and kept saying over and over again how nice and understanding I am, that I'm pretty and smart. All of these weird compliments interspersed with talking down about himself. I really didn't know what to do, so I smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry, but that I was tired and wanted to go home. That's when he started bawling. He had this weird wheezy sob, but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did this, trying to come up with some sort of graceful escape plan. My patience was wearing thin, and my anxiety was through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be annoyed and panicky at the same time. I stood up, apologized, said the park was close to my house so I'd walk, and started to leave when I remembered I'd left my things in his car. In trying a new approach, I casually mentioned I'd forgotten them and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers, he could keep them. He immediately ceased his bizarre crying, stood up and ran over to his car to unlock it, and I grabbed my stuff out of his back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmly apologized for making things weird and asked if he could please drop me off at home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes, but made him drop me off a block over from my little side street, so he wouldn't see which house was mine. I could end it there, but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after this encounter. A week or two after that weird evening, end of August by this point, I had my last day at the job and moved 1,000 miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me long ramblings, detailing his feelings about himself and our missed opportunity. I never responded to these messages. Now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text stopped after only a few weeks, and I soon forgot about him. Fast forward to February, when I get a text from a former co-worker. Her message said, Sorry you had to hear about it this way. Her message was a link to a local news article titled, Man Dies from Wounds in Riverside Stabbing This Wednesday. Because of the way she'd worded it, I thought Warner was the victim, but when I read the article, it included his mugshot and the charges. He was the attacker. He'd murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted. I couldn't believe I knew someone who killed another human being. Later on, I called an old work friend for some details. Apparently, shortly after I left the job, he was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. 
Like he just threw anything he could lift and poured all the soap out, smeared it all over the place. He then lost his apartment. I have to assume that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless drug addicts who squat in abandoned houses. I wondered if the man he stabbed had refused to give him something that he wanted. If that's how he reacted to a hard no. I don't think I made all of the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off, since he clearly was not stable. Hands down, the worst intern I've ever encountered. I'm currently a uni student, and on Tuesday nights, I come home pretty late. Not late enough that my parents would call the police or anything, but definitely just missing the regular bus times. Anyway, as luck would have it, I managed to catch the very last bus one Tuesday night after getting to the station. Typically, it's nothing to be worried about. If you keep to yourself and stick to safe-looking people, other uni students, mothers, the bus driver, you'll be pretty alright. Growing up in a dangerous country and migrating to a much safer one still hasn't rid me of those instincts. And that night, I got all bad vibes and buzzy. Something was off about that evening, but I didn't know what. And we get to the main stop, the shopping center, and I find out that the bus has terminated its route. It's done for the night. Thanks, asshole bus driver. Well, fuck. It's dark, late, I can't drive, my parents can't come pick me up, they were at yoga, and I'm too broke to afford a taxi. So I decide to walk home. The exercise would be good for me. Now, from the shopping center, it would take me a good 20 to 30 minutes to reach my house if I power walked. I could probably run home, but fuck that. When you leave the shops, if you follow the road, there's a local Catholic school, a public library, a public school, and a few bus stops along the way. Near the library is a traffic intersection, the most brightly lit area of this entire road, but it's also an extremely small square. It's a joke, honestly. As I'm walking, it takes me less than a second to realize just how fucking dark it was on that street. It was a bit creepy walking in the dark by the local Catholic school with their massive fucking crucifix in the middle of a huge mass of land. In front of me is a girl who looks about my age. Asian. She's walking very quickly. Understandable. From the corner of my eye across the road, I can see a man kind of half jogging, half walking. I'm not sure what he's up to, but it was just weird looking. I kept an eye on him and the girl. At the intersection, my friend was there and greets me enthusiastically, a hug and kiss on the cheek. He momentarily distracts me from the weird running dude and the girl. Between my friend and I greeting each other, I completely miss that the guy has crossed the street and is in my path. My friend turns out to be a douchebag friend and just leaves, even after I've told him about the weird dude. I'm not far from the creep and the girl now, but he's talking to her. And if a guy has any common sense, he won't speak to a girl or woman when she's alone at night, because we've all heard the horror stories. By this stage, I've quickened my pace into a sprint, holding onto my backpack so that my laptop inside won't make so much noise. I'm assessing my very limited options on how to save this poor woman. I'm a very small, very unintimidating Asian girl, and the guy looked bigger and bigger the closer I got. I felt very tiny and incredibly stupid for doing this because I was still kind of far away, but I have crazy good eyesight and the streetlights were hitting his face directly. I could make it out accurately enough in case I needed to identify him. He was a white male, early 30s to 40s, brown hair, wearing glasses, striped long sleeve top and brown khakis. His eyes were really big though, the kind of face you make when someone completely surprises you with something particularly scandalous. In that moment, I came up with what was probably the most stupidly brilliant plan I've ever concocted. I kind of stand there, hoodie on, feet apart, hands on my hips, and best, loudest, impersonation of an older Filipino woman getting mad at her child with the strongest accent I could. Honestly, if I were a bit taller, I might not have gotten away with this. Oi, what are you doing, huh? You were supposed to be home already, and talking to a boy, huh? And he's white, 
Excuse me, look at me while I'm talking to you. I didn't raise you like this. I don't remember exactly word for word what I yelled, but I'm basically copying whatever my mom says when she's angry with me. The entire time I'm yelling, I can see the guy is now trying to inch away, and the girl just looks so bewildered, like a deer caught in the headlights. At this stage, honestly, I'm expecting her to run away, so I turn to the guy. He fucking ran for it, I swear. It was like watching a cartoon. The girl was standing there, and I took off my hood and waved at her. I was still far away, and asked if she was alright, in my regular not very Filipino accent. She was just staring at me. I apologized if I'd scared her, but I had to get him away because my younger sister would tell me about a creepy guy that corners young girls in the park not far from where we live. Anyway, we hugged and exchanged names and numbers, and now we're basically best friends forever. It turns out that she doesn't live very far away at all, and didn't even realize what was happening until she couldn't get away from the creep. I ended up walking her home, and from there her older brother dropped me off. We called the police while we walked to her place, when we were told the story to our families. At this stage, I'd very correctly assumed they were Philo as well, so communication was easy. They banned us completely from taking the bus past seven. I was reluctant in telling my friends this because I knew they'd laugh, but it was such a serious thing. What if I hadn't been there? As comical as that sounded, she was really shaken up, but very relieved and grateful. She kept hugging me and stuff which is weird. I don't usually hug strangers. Police later stopped a nondescript station wagon about 20 minutes down the main road, and it was a man matching my description. They searched his car and found photos of girls in the glove compartment and even more on his phone. They were all Asian, specifically Filipino. Months later, after I found out about this, Mum tells me they actually found photos of my sister and I as well. It made me shudder. If that creep ever came near my little sister, I would fuck him up. I've had the misfortune of coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say I was very naive. Back when I was 20 or so, my family and I, my mom and little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a town a bit down south. It was a huge change, and as I had been living a difficult time, I welcomed the new change of scenery. It was a beautiful town in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job and became very frustrated as my mom needed a bit of help with the money as well. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. I'll call him Phil. If he ever saw us doing some shopping, he would come and chat and ask how the family were. He genuinely seemed like a decent and caring bloke. So when he said he might have a job for me in his shop with a small flat upstairs I could rent for next to nothing, I thought, okay, great, maybe things are finally looking up. Phil got our address and told me and my mum he would pop by early evening time when he had finished and take me in the car to go and see the flat. I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable, and I'm feeling a bit excited, confident, thinking, wow, a job in a flat, I've killed two birds with one stone. I just need to show him I'm sophisticated and would make a great employee. Around 8pm, he knocks on the front door, and mum answers. He tells her we'll probably only be about half an hour, and he'll have me back safe and sound in no time. Now, I didn't take my phone with me, as I had no credit to call out, and didn't think I would be needing it for just a quick trip up the road and back. In hindsight, it was an extremely stupid thing to do. Maybe if I'd had my phone on me, it would have deterred him from what he was about to do. It was already dark out, as it was March. I get into his car and we start driving. He's chatting away, asking how I am, telling me what the flat is like, when within a matter of a few minutes, I've noticed we're not taking the conventional route that takes us directly into town. At first, I think he's taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it, and just reason with myself that he knows the area better than I do. Thirty seconds after, though, 
I realize he's taking me in the complete opposite direction, and I can tell we're driving away from the populated town, and into an area where trees and swamp cover both sides of the road. My brain was now working overtime, thinking, where the fuck is this guy taking me? I just about managed to keep my composure and ask him outright, where are we going? The town's back the other way. Oh, I just thought I'd uh, take you on a little tour. It's beautiful here, many forests and peaceful places. I would love to show it all to you, he tells me in his normal cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything at that moment, because the logical and reasoning sides of my brain were in a full-blown war. I was trying to keep calm, thinking, okay, it seems fairly normal. Why wouldn't he want to show me around if it had a stunning area full of natural beauty? He's probably just proud to show me where he lives. The logical side, however, fully disagreed, and a wave of panic shoots over me. A little voice enters my head and shouts, In the dark? No, are you stupid? I just sit there in silence, taking in the scenery, which is becoming more and more sinister by the second, because at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think. All I knew was every cell in my body was screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for signposts, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that would be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from his car. Phil could obviously sense I was nervous, so he was just talking away at me about what the job's like, how his staff are friendly. Before I know it, he slowed down to a crawl and turned down a little mud rut road with a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. My stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because of the reality of what's about to potentially happen, hitting me like a freight train. I'm thinking to myself, if I jump out here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere, but my imagination starts rather helpfully flashing by images of him grabbing me before I get a chance to get out the door. I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat, not saying a word. I'm just thinking to myself that if he attacks me, don't make a sound. Don't give him the satisfaction of showing him I'm scared. My brain was about as useful as a chocolate teapot and I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was just so terrified. We come out at the top of this little dirt road, and there's a tiny little car park surrounded by woodland, with just one car sat in it. It was clear there were people in there having sex, and as he pulls near the car, I realize he's brought me to the local dogging spot. He turns to me and puts his hand on my knee. We should do what they're doing. With a deadly serious expression on his face, I make this bizarre half-nervous laugh, half-garbled high-pitched whine, and try to laugh off the suggestion to show I'm not into it, and super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle, which sounds like I've swallowed a potato whole, clearly freaks him out, and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my socially awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. It'll be fun. No one will see us. No, I don't want to. Plus, I'm seeing someone right now. I lie. But he just sits there smiling at me like a Cheshire cat, like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of this weird face. Mum will be expecting me home now. You know this. I'm sure she won't mind you being out a bit longer with me. You can trust me, you know. He tells me with a straight face as we sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip, and I tell him again. Mum is waiting for me. She'll start panicking if I'm not home in the next few minutes, so take me home now. I look him straight in the face, and he knows I'm not messing around. Okay, fine. I'll take you back now. Without another word, he drives me out of that creepy, seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt button ready to jump out. As we pull up outside our home, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away. Before he could stop me, I'm out and slam the door behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny rope fence around our garden, he gets out of his car, and my heart sinks. I think I'll pop in and see your mum quickly, he tells me. I swear I can see a smirk on his face, but I know he's only doing this because he's freaking out knowing damn well I'm going to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable, or scare me into keeping my mouth shut. 
Before I can try to talk him out of it, Mom has heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge past her, with one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen, grab a small knife out of the drawer, and fly into my little sister's room like a madwoman. Don't you dare fucking leave this room, no matter what you hear, I whisper to her. Seeing the knife I'm stuffing up my sleeve, she looks at me with a panic in her eyes and whispers back, Okay. I walk into the living room and the cheeky twat is sat on one sofa, sprawled out, comfortable as fuck like he's at home. I see red. I swear to God I felt like the Hulk. I'm ready for this bastard. I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa my mom is sitting on, the absolute farthest away from him I can manage, as he just sits there making small talk with mom about how she's finding the area, are the neighbors friendly, all while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. Hey, why don't you come and uh, sit over here next to me? He pats the couch cushion next to him. No, I'm alright here, thanks. I tell him as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve, trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of him. Why are you sat over there? Come, come here, honestly, I won't bite. He laughs and pats the seat again. My mom, bless her heart, is looking at each of us during this back and forth like a tennis match, and I can see something is registering in her eyes. She can see my behavior is all off. I've got one bum cheek weirdly perched on the sofa arm so I'm half stood up, half sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as hell, and staring at my mum in the face intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. I must have looked like a nutter. It's getting late now, so I think you should go. She finally speaks. Mum is starting to look anxious now, as she had finally twigged that something had happened. Phil gets up and agrees and mumbles something about having to check something at a shop. When he walks by me and is nearly out of the room, he pauses and turns to me, puts out his hand to shake mine. I'm thinking to myself, what a fucking weird thing to do. I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had had the knife stored. Taking it with a bit more force than is polite, he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when the tip of the blade poked into his hand. He looked down, saw the blade then looked at me. I looked at him with such disgust. Phil hightailed it out of our home so fast, he couldn't get out another word. A prick for a prick, after all. I told my mom everything, and she was fuming. We did discuss going to the police, but there wasn't really a crime committed on his part, aside from being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls my age who lived down our street, they clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I'm guessing he had probably done this type of thing before. We moved away from the area after that, so I'm glad to report I never had to see a smug face ever again. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. As always, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any criticisms on how I can make the videos better, or any thoughts about it in general, please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. As well, in the description below the video, there will be links to all of my social media, including my Facebook, Gmail, Twitter, and Twitch accounts. If you guys want to chat, please be sure to send me a message on any of those. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, please be forewarned though that I tend to go on Facebook less than the others, so it may take me a little bit longer to respond to you. Uh, if you want to send in a story, or you have a story that you'd like to be read, then please be sure to take a look at the description and send me a message on any one of those sites. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include the name of the story if it has one, the theme of the story if it has one as well, and how you would like to be credited in the video the story appears in and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. And please be sure to include as much detail as you are comfortable with, and make sure to follow proper grammar at least a little bit. Uh, that way it will be easier for me to read, and it will also be long enough to put into a video. If you guys are curious about the music used in the video, it's always listed in the description in the order which it appears, and I have links to the artists as well. I usually use Doblato Studios and Muji, so that's usually what you're going to find there. If you're curious about the art in the video, 
My art guy Alan always does all of my art for the channel. He's a very good friend of mine, and I have links to all of his social media as well. So if you like his stuff, be sure to check him out. He does commissions as well, I'm pretty sure. So if you like it, you can definitely get some good quality products from him. I don't think there's too much new updates today, uh, other than the fact that I'm very excited for the PlayStation 5 coming out, and I just ordered Pikmin 3 on the Switch, so hopefully that gets here soon. I've been waiting like three years for that because nobody bought a Wii U. So, yeah, that's my news for now. Be sure to let me know how you guys are doing as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.